Good morning and welcome to the COVID-19 and Global Surgery Management webinar sponsored by the American College of Surgeons International Relations Committee. My name is Kathleen McCann and I'm here to review a few notes before today's webinar. All attendees are muted, but we have time at the end for discussion with our panelists. Please send your questions to the chat box for discussion at the end. This webinar is being recorded and it will be available shortly after today on the college's website and the link will be sent to all participants as well. We welcome your feedback about today's webinar. Please look for a survey from us very soon. Now I'm happy to introduce Nader Hanna, the Vice Chair of the International Relations Committee, who will start today's webinar. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Kathleen. Uh, good day, everyone. It's my distinct honor uh, to moderate this <laughs> webinar about COVID-19 and global surgery management, hosted by the International Relations Committee uh, of the American College of Surgeons. Uh, the American College of Surgeons serves its fellows across the globe, and to fulfill its mission for an inspiring quality, a high standards, and better outcomes, the IRC has uh, assembled this panel of international thought leaders uh, to discuss their perspective on surgical care, and disease management during the pandemic. Uh, the expert panel will answer your questions about uh, best practices and future uh, directions. Uh, just to kind of review the numbers, as of uh, last night, uh, this dashboard is put out by the Center for System Science and Engineering at the Johns Hopkins University. And you can see from the uh, data presented, there has been over about 22 million global cases of uh, COVID-19 and 188 countries with the United States leading uh, the, nation, the world in terms of infected cases. About 773,000 uh, deaths was a mortality rate of about approximately 3.5%. If you look at the map, um, you can see uh, the active cases, or you can still see that um, the, uh, North America, South America, and in India, uh, there's still quite a bit of active cases as well as in South Africa. So this is just displays uh, the global nature of this uh, pandemic um, and how it's affecting um, our patients. Uh, without further delay, uh, I would like to introduce um, uh, our first uh, panel expert, uh, Dr. Uh, Haitham Kaparani. Dr. Kaparani is the chair uh, of the uh, fellowship subcommittee of the International Relations Committee. He's the social professor of surgery at Harvard Medical School. He's also the Director for Center for Outcomes and Patient Safety in Surgery and Director of the Wound Center at Massachusetts uh, General Hospital. Uh, Hi, I'm glad to have you. Uh, it's all yours now. You're, you're on mute. Good morning, everybody, and uh, greetings to you from Boston in the United States. I hope everybody is staying uh, safe in these very, very uncertain times. I will, uh, I have no uh, disclosures to do today, but I will be talking about three topics. Each one of them, we probably can talk about them for an hour, but I'll give you, a, if you want, an appetite opener about COVID-19, its GI complications, as well as surgical implications with specific focus on the outcomes of surgery in COVID-19 patients, and uh, also give you a hint about the, the burden of canceled surgeries of elective and, and uh, non and cancer surgery during the COVID-19 pandemic. And then Dr. Turner will talk to you more about it. So let's start with GI complications. So after the initial phase of COVID-19, it was clearly apparent that fever and respiratory symptoms were the hallmark of the disease. But as soon as we started seeing more and more patients, we realized that a lot of patients are presenting in a very uh, non-respiratory way, if you want. Fever is still the most dominant symptom when patients present. But when you look a little bit closely, you find that about a third to 40% of patients present with GI gastrointestinal symptoms rather than respiratory symptoms. This is from the very early days of the pandemic. This study is from China. Actually, it was a meta-analysis of 60 other studies with about 5,000 patients. And it found that a lot of patients are presenting with anorexia, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, as well as abdominal pain. When people looked with uh, Endoscopies, there was evidence of RNA of the SARS-2 virus in the esophagus, stomach, duodenum, rectum, as well as in the colon. There was about a 
12 studies that looked at the presence of the virus in stool, and about 50% of patients had RNA evidence of the virus in their stool. And actually, interestingly enough, this lasted up to 33 days, outlasting the, uh, the, the virus in the respiratory systems. Even more interesting than that, we found evidence of subgenomic RNA present in the stool samples, suggesting that there is active replication of the virus in the gastrointestinal system. When we look at the pathophysiology of the COVID-19 disease, it's usually dependent on the expression of two, uh, two uh, receptors, the ACE2 receptor and the TMPR SS2 uh, expression. When we look at the expression of these two receptors in the specific organs of the body, we find that the small intestine there and duodenum is a very high level of expression, suggesting there is actual disease involvement of the gastrointestinal uh, uh, system in COVID-19. How about gastrointestinal complications? And this is a study that also from the early days of the COVID-19, before we knew much about the disease, that's coming from our own research group in Boston. And what we found is the following. We found, and this is the critically ill, this is the most critically ill patients uh, who have COVID-19, they're all in the ICU, almost all of them are intubated. We found that 74% of the patients had at least one severe complication that is gastrointestinal in nature. The most common was severe dis uh, disturbance of the liver enzymes, suggesting liver damage, cholecystitis, pancreatitis, hepatic necrosis. There was about almost half the patients had a severe ileus that's for many days that uh, persisted despite all interventions. But most interestingly, there was a lot of patients who had bowel ischemia, and I'll talk a little bit more about it. So part of the ileus, there was a few patients who had colonic paralytic ileus that looks like Ogilvy's or colonic pseudo obstruction. And we don't know yet if it responds to uh, anticholinergic treatment. But bowel ischemia was the one most lethal we saw many, many cases of bowel ischemia, and now the experience has been repeated in multiple areas of the world. What was most interesting is not only the intestines had ischemia, as you can see here, and I'll talk a little bit more about the pattern, but there was also evidence of very severe liver ischemia in this patient of mine here. The ages, they were not the most comorbid patients. Some patients were as young as 30 years old. They had minimal comorbidities, and that ischemia happened day 10 to 16 from admission with a rapid clinical deterioration, and about 40 to 50% of these patients end up dying. But what's interesting, and you know, for anybody who's taken care of mesenteric ischemia before, this was not your run-of-the-mill mesenteric ischemia. On CAT scans, the vessels were patent, and there was a clear demarcation of what's dead and what's alive in these patients, suggesting a totally different mechanism for the mesenteric ischemia. What was also more interesting is lactate was normal in all of these patients that we see. So relying on lactate to rule out ischemia was not a good idea. Most patients had a significant increase in vasopressors and increase in white count. What is the potential mechanism? We have looked at the pathology of all of these patients and what we notice, as we discussed, that is relatively spared the mucosa. But what we found is there's a lot of thrombosis. You can see fibrin deposits here at the submucosal level, suggesting an inflammatory coagulopathy happening at the submucosal small vessels, uh, which is now there's more and more data emerging about the, the nature of this coagulopathy in COVID-19. But now let's shift gear a little bit. How do patients with COVID-19 do after surgery? And the best data we have comes from the COVID surge network. And it simply speaks to the power of, of social media. This was a, a friend of mine who is also in surgery connecting me and another friend, Anil Banku, in, uh, in the UK. We both had the same idea that we need to be recording the outcomes of patients with COVID-19 undergoing surgery. And now this collaboration is including more than 1,500 hospitals across more than 120 countries and we're up to 48,000 patients, COVID-19 positive patients who underwent surgery. The first report, which we published very early on, had a little bit more than 1,000 patients from 24 countries. 
and was published in The Lancet, so you can look it up and read in details. But I'll try very quickly to summarize the findings for you. So again, more than 1,000 patients, 1,128 patients, and we broke them into very different categories, which you can go in details, but this is the summary. This is the take-home message. 24% was the 30-day mortality of these patients, and more than half of them had post-operative pulmonary complications, and actually 83% of all deaths in this cohort happened in patients with pulmonary complications. Male gender, age more than 70, a high ASA grade, malignancy, emergency surgery, major surgery, predicted death. And that's why when we compare it to historical data, it looked like these patients are at a very high risk of postoperative pulmonary complications and death. For those who want a little bit more appetite uh, opening information, even elective surgery, which happened still in the early phases of the disease, mortality was 19%. When we looked at major surgery, mortality was 27, but minor surgery was up to 16% mortality, so extremely high mortality. We can even break it more, and I'll give you an example. For an, somebody aged more than 70 who's undergoing an emergency major surgery, mortality was 44%. But what's more scary, even for somebody younger than 70, undergoing an elective minor surgery who's a male, there was still a 7% mortality. So a word of caution, there's still more information to come from that network and hopefully we'll get the, the second and the third uh, report out to you soon. Finally, I wanna talk a little bit about the second surge of COVID-19, which might not be viral in etiology, it might be the surge of canceled surgeries. The same collaboration, we did try to estimate the burden of canceled surgeries. We used the Bayesian beta regression modeling which I'm not gonna go into its details now, but we estimated over 12 weeks of the pandemic, and now the pandemic is going longer, what was the number of canceled surgeries? And the number we have is 28,404,000 patients were canceled worldwide, worldwide, a very scary number. We, we discovered is 81.7% of benign surgery were canceled during the pandemic. And up to 40% of cancer surgery was uh, of cancer surgery was canceled or delayed during the pandemic. We also estimate that even if we increase the surgical capacity and workforce by 20%, it will take us up to 45 weeks to clear the backlog. So, in summary, I think there's much about COVID-19 that still remains unknown, even now, a few months later that science and data is really what we need and not anecdotes and media stunts and things shared on WhatsApp. I think COVID-19 is a systemic disease with GI manifestation, most notably is mesenteric ischemia, that surgery should be avoided when possible in COVID-19 positive patients. And the second surge might be surgical, that of canceled surgery, and Dr. Turner will be talking to you more about this. And I'll be happy to take any questions at the end of the webinar. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Kafarani, for this uh, insightful um, presentation. Um, it's uh, obviously my great pleasure and honor to present our next, uh, next panel expert, uh, Dr. Uh, Patricia Turner. Uh, Dr. Turner is uh, not only is a visionary leader in surgery, but she's also known to everybody. She is the American College of Surgeons Director Division of uh, Member Service. And her presentation is going to be about the 28 million surgeries canceled receiving surgery post COVID 19. Dr. Turner. Well, Dr. Turner is uh, unmuting her button and sharing her screen. I just want to remind all the audience uh, to. Uh, please uh, submit questions uh, as your presentation goes on. We'll, um, we'll, we'll uh, forward the questions to the panel expert and towards the end, they will be able to answer all your questions. So feel free to submit the questions. Dr. Turner. Great, thank you so much, Dr. Hanna. And good day, everyone. Um, it's really a pleasure to participate on this panel and I look forward to learning um, as much as I am contributing from these amazing panelists that we have. So. Thank you so much for the introduction, and I enjoyed your talk, Dr. Kafarani. I, I learned some things myself. Um, so we'll spend the next couple of minutes talking about 
um, the fact that there have been 28 million surgeries canceled, and how is it that we go about resuming surgery post-COVID? Uh, so 75th percentile incubation period um, prior to developing symptoms of COVID-19 is about seven days. So we estimate the incubation period to be about 14 days. So it's recommended that in your local area that there be a decrease in measures of COVID incidence for at least 14 days before you start providing surgical services for all the reasons that Dr. Kaifarani talked about. So if your numbers are still increasing locally, then you still need to be limiting the number of cases that you're doing to those that are elective or life or limb threatening. So there's a reference that I can provide for you later. We'll have resources for you. That is an entire roadmap to reopening, which you can see there on the screen. Um, so the first thing to know is what are the rates for you locally? So if the numbers in your local environment are still increasing, it really doesn't matter what's happening countrywide or statewide if in your local area, you're finding that your numbers are still increasing. So consider defining a specific criteria for a threshold of your local COVID incidence before you decide to re-enter the mitigation phase. Because in your facility, if the rates are still rising, then you still should not be going back to doing elective surgeries and want to limit yourself to those that are um, life and limb threatening. So in terms of diagnostic testing, what is it that you'll want to know? So again, you'll need to know and understand your local COVID diagnostic testing capabilities, because the fact is, is that depending on where you are, you may or may not have access to rapid testing. You may or may not have access to um, patient testing or healthcare worker testing. So the local diagnostic policies need to be set up so that everyone is working from the same set of rules. Um, so the rapid testing can be real-time RT-PCR or serologic testing for immunity. And so depending on when you try to bring your elective patients back, you'll want to have them tested prior to allowing them into your institution so that you don't, again, begin a surge. Um, you'll want to know what your diagnostic testing policies are for your healthcare workers. So again, who will be tested? How often will be, they be tested? Will it only be the OR staff? Will it also be the floor staff? What about your patient transporters? So that's going to be a priority as well. And then consider the false negatives. We know that there's up to a 30% false negative rate. So what is going to be your second test protocol for those individuals who test negative on the first test? And then finally, um, what is your testing for those patients who are under investigation? So those who perhaps in hospital become symptomatic and what will your testing protocol be for them? Another notion of preparedness has to do with the availability of personal protective devices. So what is your policy going to be at your institution in terms of PPE? So know what your availability is. Do you have um, a workforce that can have as much PPE as they need? Are you in a situation where you're going to have to limit PPE, distribute it um, to individuals one at a time? Is it the sort of thing where they will have to reuse their N95s, for example? So you'll want to work all of that out, have a protocol in place, and know how to protect your uh, OR staff in particular from exposure. Um, what is your inventory situation? Do you have a pipeline from the uh, providers? Do you have the uh, space to store? Are you going to have uh, to import your PPE? And if, is that going to be a problem for you as well? There is a CDC PPE calculator, which you can see on the screen. It's too small to look at specific numbers, but that's not really the point. What you'll see here is that you can actually decide based on the number of healthcare workers, the type of healthcare workers, the level of their exposure, what your PPE needs will be. And that's available online from the Centers for Disease Control. So you can literally plug in the floor, the operating room, the uh, other areas of the hospital, all of the individuals from the techs to the nurses to the physicians and calculate what your PPE needs will be. Um, you'll want to make sure again that you talk about those who are known positive, those that are under investigation and those that are presumed negative so that you can, um, can accurately predict what your PPE needs will be. Um, and again, uh, making sure that those who visit the hospital also um, are protected. So what is your uh, preparedness in terms of capacity? So know your, again, your local healthcare facility capacity. How many beds do you have? How many ICU beds do you have? How many ventilators do you have? 
And then what are the expansion plans? So what would you do on the weekends when you are short staffed? So again, knowing your capacity and your facility, providing care for the surgical patients when they move to the floor, when they're in the OR, when they're in the ICUs. Um, continue uh, to think about whether or not you can move your elective surgeries outside of the hospital or to a different wing of the hospital. So there are those who have um, enough space that they literally have a clean side in quotes and a dirty side. So anyone who's coming in for an elective procedure may be in an entirely different building or wing or side of the hospital from those who are presumed COVID positive or are under investigation. Um, are there procedures that are appropriate to do in the outpatient setting or in the office setting so that you diminish the requirements for your infrastructure? Um, collaboration of OR schedules to make sure that you can accommodate the emergent cases um, and that there is um, a ramp up notion that you've discussed across specialties. Because again, whether you're doing cancer cases or orthopedic cases or otolaryngology cases, there'll need to be some consistent themes throughout your operating room. Um, we've talked a little bit about anticipating the demand as Dr. Kafarani shared with us. It will be um, quite some time before we can clear the backlog, even if we were to increase capacity by 20%. So again, think about which are the cases that need to be done first, what is the capacity necessary for the emergency cases that we will still see? And then engineering issues, again, depending on your institution, you may need to think about how do you reverse the airflow in your operating room and other actual engineering or physical plant uh, notions. Um, preparedness in terms of your healthcare workers, um, I won't read this to you, but again, workforce staffing issues are priorities. So make sure that you can cover expanded hours, make sure that you have an infrastructure in place. Should your healthcare workers become positive, what are you going to do to backfill? Um, what about stress and fatigue and burnout and well-being? Be mindful that that is a priority for our healthcare workers. Um, can we do creative staffing solutions to um, cross cover other areas of the hospital? So can we use our individuals who are COVID negative to cross cover those who have to be uh, quarantined? And um, the, the next notion is, is this governance. So have in place governance infrastructure for your hospital and for your operating room to create a governance committee to decide how you're going to manage your policies around all of the things that we've talked about, whether it's PPE, whether it is exposure, whether it is case uh, priority. And then they're going to need to function in real time to evaluate the problems that will come up whether it has to do with nursing or case orientation and that sort of thing. Be data driven. Um, as you saw from Dr. Kaifarani's data, there are a number of resources that one can use to capture data and let that be your guide as far as utilization and efficiency. Um, again, additional topics that you'll wanna consider, prioritization, the patient backlog, clinical priorities, patient access, um, and safety and quality, of course. Patient communication. So surgery patients may have concerns or questions about the ramp up. Is it safe for them to come back to the hospital? So you want to have clear messaging, communicate very clearly. You may need a multidisciplinary committee to do that to make sure that you're approaching all of the uh, individuals that need to be approached. Um, and then again, the things that you'll wanna to communicate to the patients are what is the prioritization? Where can they expect to fall on the hierarchy? Um, what are the COVID testing policies for the patients? Do we have counseling that we can provide? What about PPE use? Can family or visitors come to the hospital? What happens after discharge? Is there screening post-op? And then what about all payer classes? So for those who have insurance uh, issues, you're going to need to be mindful about what is and what is not covered. So surgery prioritization. So again, we've talked about this, a collaborative process to identify the order in which cases should be resumed. Um, and be sure that you are mindful of local and regional and national epidemiologic trends as you talk about uh, reopening. So that process should be applicable across surgical specialties. Again, we are all one single house of surgery. And then being very transparent is a priority. What are the rationales? Um, what is the framework that we're using? And how is it that, that the decisions will be made and who will be making those decisions? Uh, so more on prioritization. So again, prioritize and integrate the emergent, the urgent operative cases. Clearly those continue to be a priority and must be done first. 
Um, think about increased OR volume, the staffing issues we've already discussed, and be mindful that these will have to change. One size will not fit all. So this is a, a paper from the University of Chicago about the MENTS score. So there is an actual calculation that can be done to decide what you do with the patients. So if your MENTS score is low, um, and again, we don't have time to pursue exactly how that's calculated, um, the notion is that if your MENTS score is low, there's a favorable surgical risk, favorable risk to the personnel, favorable resource utilization, and you should proceed. Conversely, if your uh, MENTS score is quite high, um, that's worse outcomes for the patient, excessive risk to personnel, excessive resource utilization, and it is not justified to proceed. And then those here in the middle, um, that's reserved for those who are urgent or emergent cases. Um, so again, um, there are data-driven quality metrics that one can use. The ACS has um, the, the red book, so to speak, to help make those decisions. And this is just an example looking at the five phases of surgical care that you'll want to consider pre-op, immediate pre-op, intra-op, post-op, and post-discharge. And there are quality metrics in each of those five phases. Um, so with that, I will end. Thank you so much to uh, have the opportunity to share and look forward to answering questions at the end. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Turner, for this informative. I'm sure um, there's a lot of uh, feedback we're gonna get, especially in uh, places where COVID still, uh, incidence still high. Um, next, it's my distinct pleasure to introduce uh, our next panel expert, uh, Dr. Richard Lowe. Uh, Dr. Lowe is the clinical professor, Department of Surgery at the University of uh, Hong uh, Kong. Dr. Lowe, you are on. Uh, good evening from this part of the world. Uh, this is Richard Lowe from Hong Kong. I'd like to share with you some of uh, our thoughts on the delays in the care in the COVID era. Now, Dr. Turner and Dr. Kafarani have discussed uh, with you some of the issues of the hazards of doing surgery on COVID patients and also the load of these cancel cases that will come back and haunt us in months to come. But there are other surgeries that cannot wait. Now, we have, it's not unique to us, to other medical specialties as well. But for us, these cases will include those with an acute abdomen, those with trauma, or those like uh, a dissecting aortic aneurysm. Now, in terms of delays, there are certainly contribution from the patients and also our own contribution from the health providers. On the patient side, the usual denials, the ignorance, and then in the COVID era, the fear of going to the hospital and getting infected. A little bit of the control would be the travel inconvenience when there's a lockdown and for some of these patients who have lost a job and therefore the insurance, finance is a real uh, problem. On our part, it's all a matter of availability and also the resources, both in the hospitals, for the doctors, how much testing there is and what the uh, number of beds and ICU beds are available and the other ancillary supports. By way of a case presentation, let me highlight some of the areas that we see the delays. This is a true uh, case, 52-year-old male with abdominal pain, presented to the ER, was given a diagnosis of gastroenteritis, and then sent home. He came back to the ER 24 hours later with more pain, and this time localized to the right lower quadrant. The uh, ER doctor recommended that a CT be performed, but in order to get to that department, a COVID test was required, even though it was so-called a rapid test, but the patient waited in the emergency room for another 12 hours, and indeed, the COVID test came back negative. Now, the CT showed 
a ruptured appendix in the rectocecal area and an abscess. So he underwent a laparotomy and uh, drainage of the, uh, the abscess. But that's not the end of the story. Because of the uh, rupture and the uh, abscess formation, he had further abscesses. He had fever and then confirmed uh, abscess and was strained percutaneously. And four days later, another pigtail was used to drain some of these undrained areas. However, he still had persistent collection that tracked up to the uh, retroperitoneum, and I will show you a CT later on. And the poor man ended up with another laparotomy and open drainage. Here, you can see the large abscess in the retroperitoneum from a ruptured appendix. Now, we all know that it's so intuitive that delay in recognition, delay in care leads to pro progression and therefore complications and morbidities. And sometimes these can be life threatening. So every step along the way here, we may see a delay from the time the patient presented at the ER and like in our case, the imaging, the patient gets to be uh, uh, taken to be the uh, hospital, maybe put in isolation ward before he goes to surgery. Now, the delay, the case in point here is uh, a report that came out last month uh, from the University of Hong Kong uh, Department of Medicine, actually, but it highlights the uh, delay. If you look at this bar chart over here, the uh, white represents the uh, pre-COVID era. In stroke patients, there is this four to five hours golden hour that they need to come to the ER, get diagnosed, get on the table, and get the thrombolysis. Before COVID, a lot of them get to the hospital within an hour and a half. Whereas in the COVID era, it is another one hour before they show up again because of the uh, delay or maybe the wait uh, for transportation, whatever. Interestingly, from the time they hit the door of the emergency room, to the time they get on the table for the, uh, for the needle, uh, it is shorter. Uh, and overall, the number of patients uh, going within a uh, uh, four to five hours is a little bit more in the uh, pre compared to the post COVID. So this is a reflection of the kind of delay that uh, is we can extrapolate to surgical cases as well. Now, in terms of the uh, health care providers, we're talking about just resources in one simple word. It's the availability and the allocation of the uh, beds and the wards in the hospital. Are there enough PPE and ventilators? The anesthesiologists are concerned whether or not this patient will be a, a, um, a risk to them because they need to intubate the patients. The surgeons is, is concerned about exposure as well and whether or not we're gonna get OR time. And they are certainly, the delay will aggravate the clinical conditions. Now, where can we minimize these delay? If I may propose that like, if it is at all possible and resources are there, that when they present at the ER, and they look like they may be an admission that they should have that COVID test right there. And, um, and they can go straight to an isolation ward, be investigated, worked up, and then do the imaging if ever, and then uh, go, to the, uh, go to the operating theater if indicated. Now, uh, the different, like Dr. Turner pointed out, different locales, different states have different patterns. And this is a report uh, that came out this month on the, um, 
different uh, states. This is a collection of four states. In the uh, dark green, uh, the ER visits that were in March when the uh, COVID really hit hard, the number of ER visit actually went down, whereas the number of COVID cases went up. However, when they get to the ER and get admitted, it corresponded in a parallel fashion with the rise in COVID cases. And uh, this is in uh, New Jersey, same thing, New York, where it's like in the Connecticut and in North Carolina, the graph is fairly flat. And again, reflecting that the uh, COVID has not hit these states hard. Now, one of the things that we are doing here in Hong Kong that we have done actually is to have a temporary hospital to house the less severe cases. If you look at this, this is in a convention center and you know how big those are. And with compartments, now these are the uh, patients who have um, passed the positive for antibodies or they are tested negative for uh, the COVID uh, 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 virus. If you look at uh, one of the hospitals well, that is representative of our locale is that indeed in the uh, orange bar is the uh, is 2020 compared to the year before we certainly have a decrease in the number of cases that we're doing, but not by much. And uh, even though a lot of the elective cases have been canceled, uh, it has not affected us that much. Now, the uh, American College certainly uh, is well aware of the, the risk to personnel, and we have these recommendations for uh, the surgeons. And you can find that on the ACS website for the protection before, during, and after the operation. In the same, in the same um, uh, uh, link, there is the uh, University of Kansas uh, recommendation how the uh, doctors, the surgeons, should protect themselves, and it is in the uh, in the website. This is an Italian study that came out in May, and uh, they talked about the uh, emergency uh, surgery during this pandemic. You will remember Italy was hit hard, the first one to be affected in Europe. And um, so the thing that they are concerned about mainly is the aerosol, both in terms of contact with the patients, but especially during laparoscopy, when the uh, electrocord-free ultrasonic scalpels are used. So they also made a comment that, yes, they can do a universal precaution for everybody, but uh, these gadgets, these PPE, are rather uncomfortable if you want to do a three or four hour case. And uh, so one of the suggestions, they say, well, maybe we go back to doing lap more laparotomies instead of doing laparoscopies. For these less significant surgical pathologies, but we all know that the treatment strategy should remain the same. And uh, the, if these cases can wait a few hours, unlike our patient, they want to wait for the, uh, the uh, COVID swap results and then proceed with laparoscopy, say, for the uh, gallbladders and for the appendices. Now, they also in the discussion mentioned that, well, maybe the surgeons are concerned about their safety of themselves and the, uh, the uh, uh, co-workers, maybe they can do something more conservative, the good old submarining. But again, 
these cases, even though they may appear less significant, but the risk is still there and it can develop into gangrene, perforation, and peritonitis. And the question is whether or not laparotomy instead of laparoscopy will do the job. And the answer is a probably yes. Uh, in terms of other trauma like orthopedics, this is a Spanish study. They have an, a logarithm. And again, at the door, they tested them for the COVID test. If it's negative, they go right ahead. Otherwise, they, uh, they wait. And if it's positive, then they have another route. The uh, ACS, the anesthesiologist group, and the nursing group and American Hospital Association have a joint statement. Uh, this came out a week ago. And again, this is a roadmap I had, uh, like Dr. Turner has uh, alluded to, how to maintain essential surgery during this period. And I think if we do a concerted effort, uh, we can get over this particular um, pandemic and hopefully uh, we would have a better uh, outcome for our patients. In the remaining half a minute, let me just give you an idea of what is happening in our locale. We had a wave in, uh, in uh, March from people coming back from overseas, and then another wave in the uh, uh, late, later part of July and in August. But then as of um, the middle of August, three days ago, uh, we are back to double digits per day. And overall, we have had 4,400 confirmed cases. Three quarters of them have recovered, and we had 69 deaths, mostly in um, elderly patients with comorbidities. And uh, some of the effective methods is the use of mask, closure of schools, uh, social distancing, closure of bars and restaurants, and limitation of uh, travel, building of more facilities, and identification of, pos of people who may need to have uh, quarantine. Uh, so far, knock on wood, we have been lucky, and uh, so um, it's something that we can share with the rest of our surgical communities worldwide. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Richard, for this insightful and kind of practical hands-on experience with patients in, in Hong Kong. Um, it gives me my next pl pleasure to introduce our next speaker, uh, saving the best for last. Uh, it's an honor to present Dr. Heba Abdelaziz. Uh, Heba uh, is uh, the ACS governor for Qatar. Uh, she is the vice chair uh, for the Fellowship Subcommittee of the International Relations Committee, and she's a senior consultant at the Department of Surgery, Ahmad uh, General Hospital in Qatar. Uh, Heba will be talking to us about acute care surgeons turned into COVID-19 intensivists. Uh, Heba, it's all yours. Thank you so much, Dr. Hanna. I would like to thank the college and the International Relations Committee for allowing me this opportunity to discuss some unprecedented measures in truly unprecedented times, the COVID-19 era. With some hospitals reporting a 44-fold increase in inpatient COVID-19 cases within a period of four to six weeks, multimodal strategies to increase the capacity and provide advanced intensive care had to be enacted. The number of rapid response rates and overhead codes increased dramatically across most of the hospitals, with some of these hospitals reporting more than a third of their patients requiring mechanical ventilation and intensive care. This had to result in a shift in emergency general surgery cases. While acute care surgery uh, traditionally may have covered up to 75% of these shifts, in some cases, coverage had to be delegated to surgical subspecialists and other non-ACS general surgeons. With the surge in COVID-19 admissions, acute care surgeons dedicated their time not only to caring for critically ill patients, but they also had to supervise non-critical care surgeons 
deploy to COVID-19 units and supervise residents and um, expand the available pool of intensivists. Acute care surgeons act in a surgical intensivist. They help to refresh non-critical care surgeons on critical care rounding checklists and goals, and they provided an educational overview of ventilator strategies, antibiotic stewardship, and COVID-19 related treatment protocols before these non-critical care surgeons were um, allowed solo management of critical care patients. The non-critical care surgeons who manage the COVID ICU patients in the SICU were buttressed by the ACS surgeons and the capable surgical ICU nurses. And critical care surgeons were spread throughout ICUs with supplementary non-critical care surgeons and this afforded hospitals the means to deal with the daily influx of cash in patients. Assiduous adherence to universal precautions and hospitals' provision of adequate PPE to frontline workers decreased the essential staff influx and time off for illness. This graph from NYU, it shows how quickly and dramatically their normal adult ICU capacity was surpassed within a matter of a few days and how they um, decided to hold elective surgery and redeploy the general surgeons to cover acute care surgery and while the surgical intensivist uh, focused on covering the COVID ICUs. These lessons of rapid triage, personal safety of healthcare workers, team dynamics and transported patients to tertiary facilities were learned from the widely successful educational campaigns hosted by the American College of Surgeons, Committee on Trauma, and the Society of Critical Care Medicine. The efforts of the surgical staff um, in acute care surgery to cross cover their own specialty and critical care to be redeployed and to work with new team members were nothing short of heroic. Given our unique training uh, as acute care surgeons that spanned from both the immediate response required during a mass casualty, whether this being airplane crashes or mass shootings or bombings, to the stabilization phase in the OR and ultimately to the recovery and rehabilitation phase, we were well prepared to apply our skills to contributing towards the global action required to restore healthy safety to our society. This diagram from the Society of Critical Care Medicine, it depicts um, uh, the tiered staffing strategy for pandemic uh, in patients requiring significant mechanical ventilation and how the trained um, critical care surgeon can oversee the non-critical care surgeons um, and ICU mid-levels and residents. I would like to share uh, the experience of Qatar with COVID-19. Like many countries that have been afflicted by um, the pandemic, Qatar did have its uh, fair share of cases. And since the first case was reported on February 29, multiple initiatives were instituted pertaining to healthcare and social aspects. A system-wide incident command committee was uh, appointed by the Ministry of Public Health to steer the day-to-day -day comprehensive measures of combating the pandemic. Among the tasks of this committee was providing the right protective equipment and to support the frontline staff providing daily updates. Um, the committee will on a daily basis send out uh, to healthcare workers emails, um, letting them know about the, the total number of patients who are tested, the total number that tested positive, the number of admissions to the hospital, number of admissions to ICUs, um, the, um, number of deaths and uh, the recovered patients. Um, it also addressed the concerns of its frontline staff. Several hospitals were designated to care for COVID-19 patients only while maintaining other facilities is completely COVID-19 free. Um, Hazime Barik Hospital uh, is an example of one of these uh, COVID-19 designated hospitals and its capacity increased within a very short period of time from 118 to 267 beds um, to care for the adult uh, patient population. Um, the pediatric and OB hospitals also followed suit. There was also uh, field hospitals that were established uh, to increase the capacity. The capacity of critical care and acute care beds was increased to its maximum. 
uh, there was a preparedness to care for 400 ventilated patients at any one time. Luckily, this number did not um, cross 300. Remote access channels to healthcare services in the form of virtual consultations and virtual OPD appointments were created. Over the phone, mental health assistance for staff and the public was set up. A drive-through COVID-19 testing facility for recent travel travelers was launched. A new expedited testing and reporting process was launched, providing test results in approximately four hours. An N95 mask and a PPE were provided for all frontline staff in the following areas, the AD, uh, ambulance services, COVID-19 designated hospitals, the CDC, and critical care areas. With regard to social distancing and containment, all public, public gatherings, including prayers, were suspended. All restaurants were closed except for delivery services. Uh, groceries and pharmacies remained open uh, as these were deemed essential, but they had no defined working hours. All inbound flights were canceled except for cargo and transit and employees whose nature of work didn't require their presence were required to work from home and all marine sports activities were banned. For communication and awareness, a coronavirus information service was launched in WhatsApp and an FM broadcasting station in some popular languages, giving the multinational residents of the country was established to disseminate information. An awareness campaign was instituted using drones with loudspeakers and a robot to broadcast information on the importance of social distancing to residents in various parts of the country. A COVID-19 hotline with different languages was launched to receive any queries. This is swift response and um, comprehensive measures are actually credited for containing um, the virus uh, within a short period of time and uh, allowing the, a phase three opening of the country. Uh, currently, the country is in phase three and by September 1st, it will move to the last phase, phase four. Before I conclude, I would like to um, say that uh, as the numbers um, of affected patients grow daily, my confidence also grows that united and with our shared expertise and knowledge, we will finally win this fight. Stay safe, everyone, and thank you very much for your attention. Great. Thank you very much, Dr. Abdelaziz. I would also like to thank all the, ex uh, the panel member for uh, their uh, excellent presentation, which is quite timely. I think we have uh, time for questions uh, that uh, um, were submitted. I'm going to actually start asking the question to the panel. Um, and I'm going to try to group them in, in categories. The first category is related to uh, what would be described as high risk procedure for droplet. And that include endoscopy and ENT. So a couple of questions, you know, what precautions need to be taken when a patient needs endoscopy or, um, you know, ENT patient who needs an endoscopic examination. What precautions should be taken? Dr. Kafarani and Dr. Uh, uh, Lowe. Uh, yeah, this is a very good question. So in addition to intubation and bronchoscopies in the hospital, as you said, dental procedures, ENT procedures, and endoscopies are the highest risk because there is aerosolization. And by highest risk, let's clarify to the listener that we're talking about the healthcare provider catching uh, the infection themselves. So the answer is, you should, you, you, if you have the time, if the urgency of the procedure allows you to test these patients, you should be testing these patients. And with a PCR that's negative and have them having no symptoms, that should be enough for you to proceed with the surgery, arguably with just a, a surgical mask. However, if, the, if, the, if you cannot wait for the procedure for, to, for the PCR to happen, I strongly recommend that full PPE should be employed by every healthcare worker. And I would even say that we know that the, the sensitivity is only 70% of the PCR from the nasal swabs if in patients who are either at, in high endemic areas um, or in patients who have some symptoms suggesting they could have or have been exposed to infected patients, you should use full PPE. So if you're in doubt, use the full PPE unless you tested them negative and you are in a low endemic area. That's my take on it. Richard, um, 
what's the uh, the protocol in Hong Kong? What do you guys do for droplet high risk droplet procedure like endoscopy and ENT examination? Do well, we protocol? certainly agree with Dr. Kafarani about uh, taking these precautions. Um, well, ideally, a, a COVID test will tell us, but uh, again, as alluded to, there will be false negatives. So all patients will be considered uh, at, uh, at risk and we take full precautions. Uh, in our institution, the uh, endoscopies, if they are, uh, need to be intubated, the uh, anesthesiologist certainly will have full PPE and rather than putting uh, the head near the, uh, the mouth uh, using the lar laryngoscope, we have these optical laryngoscopes that they can do it uh, literally at arm's length. Now, as far as the uh, endoscopies uh, are concerned, we use, uh, ideally, use a negative pressure room and also uh, using air purifiers uh, in the room, uh, almost right next to the uh, to the patient, and uh, so that any any aerosol will be captured by these uh, purifiers. That's what we've been doing uh, for last uh, few months. Dr. Hanna, um, if I might add one point, um, I think also what is being done is um, in operating rooms or in endoscopy suites is really emptying the room. So that all ancillary staff leaves the room, including the surgeon, so that it is literally the patient and the anesthesiologist, for example, that are in the room, so fewer individuals are exposed. Right. Thanks, Dr. Turner. That's a great uh, point. Uh, another question is related to actually uh, pediatric patients um, who are COVID positive but asymptomatic. Uh, what's the time interval of performing an elective and emergency operation? Um, is there any guidelines? in pediatric patients, COVID positive, but asymptomatic? That's a challenging question. I, I actually, um, trying to look the answer for that, I didn't see any specific guidelines, but anybody? Um, has I mean, I'll, I'll take a crack at it. I have to confess, I don't know these data um, and we can certainly find out and report back, um, but I would say a couple of things. In general, we anticipate that our younger patients will do better but there are absolutely instances of, you know, Kawasaki-like disease and other, you know, significant outcomes, even in the pediatric population. So I might say that the same rules generally apply. Perhaps there's a little bit of a lower threshold to proceed if someone is young, pediatric, as opposed to um, older, but I I'm not sure that I know those data enough to say that um, with a definitive answer. Okay. Others may know more. Yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm happy to take a step too, and I'm gonna confess that the data is not as clear yet, and we, we hope to have more data on this issue. But I would say common sense should rule, and three things should be kept in mind. The most important one is how urgent is the case? If this is a very urgent case, that delaying it will harm the patient, that's one. If there are no alternatives that are reasonable to surgery, then you just need to do the procedure and you take full precautions and hopefully they do well. Now, if the procedure is something that delay by a few weeks is not going to impact the patient outcome, then I would suggest we do that. And again, I say that with the caveat that we don't have clear evidence yet, but this evidence comes from the extrapolation of our the first report on COVID surge, which did have patients who are 16 to 18, so not exactly pediatric, but almost. And what we found is even patients who were asymptomatic, even patients undergoing minor procedures, even patients undergoing minor procedure under, general, uh, under a regional or local anesthesia, there was still a risk of pulmonary complications and a risk of mortality. So uh, until we have more data, I would suggest if you can delay until their PCR is negative, that's what I would do. If you cannot delay, you just do it. Thanks, Dr. Kaparani. So there are a couple of questions related to the accuracy of testing. Uh, we know that the PCR accuracy is about 70% or 30% false negative. Uh, do we have any information about the rapid test accuracy that is available 
results in four hours. And the B procedures in the surgery was the M modified mask in view of the 30% false positive negative was the PCR. Do we have any um, more information about the accuracy of the rapid testing? I don't think, um, I'm not sure there's any published data about the accuracy of the, of the rapid testing. Um, I know uh, in our uh, institution, for example, uh, do the rapid testing for everybody that comes in preoperatively uh, in the, through, or through, through the emergency room. For elective cases, we still do the PCR uh, within 48 to 72 hours from the planned uh, operation. Uh, it's common practice is again, common sense that we all have the N95. So we usually wear the N95 and then we put a surgical mask um, you know, on top of that, and just to be on the safe site, uh, because we maintain obviously the the, 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 the risk, and we need to maintain uh, adequate uh, PPE. Uh, any uh, panel members have and, any comments? Yeah, on that? my yeah, my impression is the rapid testing is your quick uh, screening test. I know that um, some of the trauma hospitals, for instance, they use it to screen their patients on admission. Uh, and you know some of the journals, journals in general surgery also it's used to be uh, to screen patients um, on admission, but you have to follow it with a PCR. Okay, uh, one question perhaps for Dr. Tafani is uh, the thrombotic complication. We know patients with COVID nineteen have increased risk of thromboembolism. Um, is that the reason why they have uh, this major GI complication? Uh, is there any prophylactic ways of minimizing that risk? And if the patient does have a thromboembolic complication, is the treatment the same as regular uh, thromboembolic or they need to be uh, treated with more aggressively or, or for how long? Do we have any data on that? Yes, uh, and that's a very good question, uh, Dr. Hanna and, uh, and the, uh, the listener who asked that question. Uh, you know, for the, for, because of the shortness of time, I didn't go into those details, but yes, we have some emerging evidence on the issue. The first thing is there is definitely evidence of inflammatory coagulopathy happening in these patients. And this is coming with uh, normal PT, normal PTTs, and, and not as much as your classical coagulopathy. The one marker that's showing the highest correlation with the incidence of uh, hypercoagulopathic events is the D-dimer level. And there's a very nice study uh, that early on also came from China as well that, uh, that looked at patients who received prophylactic anticoagulation because uh, you know, not in, in the hospitals in China where this came from, actually they don't give it routinely to, uh, to patients. This is not only surgical patients, by the way, COVID-19 patients in general. And they look at patients who received prophylactic anticoagulation and patients who did not receive prophylactic anticoagulation and, and looked at the incidence of thrombotic events. There was no difference unless the D-dimer was six to eight times higher than the normal. So for patients whose D-dimer, you should be following them serially in the patients. And as the D-dimer start increasing, you really want to make sure your patients is prophylactic prophylactically anticoagulated. Uh, and patients who, who actually had elevated D-dimers not only had a higher rate of thrombotic events, but also a higher rate of deaths. Now, the other question that you might be alluding to is should we just fully anticoagulate these patients if the incidence right. is so high? Uh, if, you know, in one of the slides that I showed, I, I didn't emphasize it, is there was about 11% risk in the critically ill patients of GI bleeds. And actually, I had also quite a few patients who developed spontaneous retroperitoneal bleeds when we were fully anticoagulating them. So the answer is it's a risk benefit. And I would say I would not routinely, that's what the risk benefit analysis shows now. I would not just empirically fully anticoagulate patients with COVID-19, even if they're in the ICU, but I would have a low threshold to fully anticoagulate them. If their A-line, arterial line starts clotting, their central line starts clotting, they have a DVT, superficial thrombosis, and their D-dimers are above 1,500 is where I would start fully anticoagulate these patients. Thanks, Dr. Kaparani. Uh, Richard, Dr. Lowe, there's uh, several questions related to laparoscopy. Uh, and one particular question, you know, doing appendectomy. Is laparoscopic appendectomy still doable in the COVID-19 era or should we be doing them open? And, um, you know, for, 
moving on was was laparoscopic surgery and doing the pandemic. Uh, what's your perspective? Should we continue doing laparoscopic, be more selective? And if we're doing it, is there any special equipment that we need to be used in terms of trocar or negative pressure suction and things like that? Well, I, I believe that the, um, the COVID patients with appendicitis can still be done laparoscopically if one takes the right precautions, meaning that you uh, do less cautery. Sometimes that cannot, uh, that, that is unavoidable. Then you do not use very high pressures for the pneumoperitoneum and uh, be sure that the, uh, the suction devices uh, are, are connected to some sort of air, air filtration system. And I think that's certainly doable. Now, is a, uh, an open appendectomy is a perfectly acceptable uh, alternative and probably is a good alternative uh, as well. It uh, certainly minimizes the aerosol, uh, the risks, and uh, and instead of relying just on the acortery, there's a lot of like you know, uh, cutting and dividing and ligating, and so you you actually minimize the amount of acortery, and then there is no uh, almost no other risk except for the splatter uh, that uh, you that that you get with. Uh, the, the, the open cases. And I think that would be, if explained to the patient that it's accepted uh, by the patients, then I think it's a perfectly okay. Now, let me put, put this in another way. And um, if the anesthesiologist is reluctant to intubate the patient, can we not do a um, spinal anesthesia, epidural anesthesia, and then open appendectomy. And I think, you know, that is a, uh, a certainly a way to, to minimize risk to everybody. Okay. Um, I think we're running close to time, but I have a final question. Uh, as far as this protective, uh, personal protective equipment and measures, uh, do we have uh, any information about the rate of health care worker and specifically surgeon infection despite all these protective measures? Is there any data um, that we have, at least in the U.S.? Uh, I don't know about the U.S., but, for, but in Hong Kong, and I think they're saying that like the... Uh, the, the doctors who are in the acute care wards uh, would need five changes a day in order to take care of the, uh, the patients adequately and protect themselves adequately. Five changes. Okay. And so, another, I, I don't think uh, we have clear data on surgeons in specific. But I can tell you, I mean, we in, in Boston, we were hit very early on and we saw at Mass General about 6,000 patients total with COVID-19. And at some point we had 187 intubated patients in the ICU with COVID-19. So as acute care surgeons, our group was very much immersed and was a lot of unknowns, it was anxiety provoking. But, uh, you know, we immersed ourselves. We did use PPE very, uh, very, in, in a very strict fashion and uh, not a single surgeon got positive, at least not symptomatically. We didn't routinely keep testing ourselves, but right. none of us developed any serious uh, infection. It's not real data, but we were doing tracheostomies, uh, laparotomies, everything you can imagine on very sick patients spiking to 106 temperatures, and none of us got it with adequate PPE. Okay, great. Thanks very much, uh, everybody, for the panel, for this great panel discussion. I want to just point out to the, to the uh, audience uh, that uh, the American College of Surgeon has a lot of resources for COVID-19. You can see on the screen um, the website where you can really go and have, um, uh, you can browse certainly all the clinical guidelines and checklists and discussions that you can see. Uh, I also want to point out uh, about some important um, uh, conferences that's going to happen in the near future. 
uh, which are I mean, be obviously virtually, but the key thing here, they are all free. So including the American College of Surgeon Quality and Safety Conference, uh, this is happening uh, next week between August 21 and 24th. You need to register and you have the website on the screen. This is a great conference for those who are interested in quality and safety, especially in the COVID-19 era. Obviously, the premier uh, meeting for the American College of Surgeons of the Clinical <laughs> Congress, uh, which is again going to be virtual on, from October 3rd to the 7th. The great news is it's free. So everybody um, and you can certainly uh, register when the registration opens and you can certainly tune in. It will be a great presentation. Uh, you can watch it at your convenience at home. It's free. A uh, great resource and for continuous medical education and optimal information uh, regarding you know, surgical advances, including uh, in sub subspecialty. Uh, the International Relation, uh, Relations Committee is planning to have a webinar uh, related to trauma. Uh, preparedness, especially updates and lessons from the last incident that happened in Lebanon. This is again is going to be a free uh, webinar, uh, and again registration will be opening soon, and certainly we'll uh, will be advertising that uh, as well. Uh, I know we did not have a time to answer all the questions, but please feel free to reach out uh, to the ACS, and you have here a list of the contacts, uh, contacts information, whether by email, phone number. Uh, Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, and YouTube. You can certainly uh, reach on uh, any of the ACS contacts, and we certainly love to hear uh, feedback about this. Uh, uh, thanks, everybody. Uh, have a great day, and keep safe, and God bless. Thank you.